In this episode, we'll be talking about the changing relationship people have with products and services. We'll talk about how product design and service design relate to each other. And we'll also talk about what you must know as a service designer moving forward. And here is the guest of this episode. Hi, I'm Mark, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to a new episode of the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to create more human-centered services. And we know that this is important, but also can be a bit of a struggle sometimes. So on the show, we talk about topics ranging from design thinking and customer experience to organizational change and creative leadership. If these are the things you're interested in, know that we bring a fresh new episode every two weeks. If you don't want to miss anything, click that subscribe button. And if you want to show your support, click that like button or leave a short comment. It lets me know that the things we do here are appreciated by people like you. My guest in this episode is Mark Rolson. Mark is the chief creative and co-founder of Argo Design, and he worked for Frog Design for over 20 years, helping them to grow to the company it is today. In the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be talking about topics like the changing relationship people have with products and services. We'll talk about how service design relates to product design these days. And we'll also talk about what you need to know as a service designer moving forward. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. And in case you'd like to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. For now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hey, good morning. Yeah, yeah it's afternoon uh, here in the Netherlands, but it's uh, morning in Austin, right? Yeah, good morning, good day, good night, <laughs> wherever you might be. Mark, you have an awesome background. It's the Argo studio you're in right now, right? That's right. Yeah, you can see the studio behind me. Yeah, people listening to the podcast should really check out the video uh, <laughs> too. So, uh, Mark, really curious, and I ask this to all the guests who appear on the show. Do you remember the first time that you actually got in touch with service design, with the term? Oh yeah, uh, for me, pretty late in my career, uh, frankly, because uh, as a product designer, we tended to frame everything in terms of the overall experience design problem. And, you know, I started my career back in the early 90s, and so, and really engaged product design, I'd say formally, outside of more of kind of a just being a designer who will do anything to get work. Uh, I'd say around 94, I started work, 1994, I started working with Frog Design. Uh, and we, through those early years, uh, were really just trying to figure out all of the tenets of a broader landscape of experience design. In other words, it wasn't merely going to be industrial design and branding, but the overall definition of a product experience that someone would have. And of course, as that grew up and as more of that problem became software, we would encounter the notion of services. Yeah, and yeah. eventually yeah. we encountered a few folks who called themselves service designers. <laughs> which was like, You're what? What do you do? What is and I remember my initial questions like, so what do you make if you're a service designer? And that you know, it's a really fascinating uh, thing to hear about and more than anything, I, I think it was a real sign that some of the greater um, push points or uh, factors to design were moving from the definition of an artifact mm -hmm. uh, to the definition of the sort of process of engagement to the experience the touch point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of these things were going to be completely concrete anymore. And uh, of course, we've seen what technology's done to the overall. Uh, world of product design and mm -hmm. so service design has become a, a really critical component and it's also I think in from my perspective deeply integrated to the notion of experience design. I still have a hard time thinking of it uh, too discreetly you know. That, I, I guess that that will be uh, a central topic in uh, what we are going to talk about so uh, let's let's ju just jump right into the, the topics you handed me and 
uh, let's see where this show, this episode uh, has. And the first topic sure. is uh, called relationship relationships with, with products, products and, and services. services. What's the question? Yeah. Is? All right. Relationships with products and services uh, for 20. Uh, for <laughs> jeopardy here. Um, okay, so I think the question is really um, what has and is changing about our relationships with products and services given particularly what's going on uh, with technology, how technology is developed to change uh, those relationships that we have. And I think in general, I'd sum it up first in, in the most simplest terms as we've long had relationships with the products around us as a very static thing. Um, these products we would engage more or less as tools. Mm. Uh, something was designed to do what it did, and it consistently did that. Uh, and to a lesser degree, but still critically, um, services were the same thing. You had a relationship with your bank, and it was a very fixed relationship. Um, and the process um, for engaging them, you know, despite all the human niceties, was a fairly um, limited concept of the process. Mm -hmm. they knew about you what you let them know about you uh, and so forth. Um, but technology of course has changed that equation. Um, first of all, you know, we could easily say that processes um, around services and products lived in different worlds. Maybe services would engage a product, but you really didn't engage services and products in a single design problem. Mm -hmm until technology really started forcing the two to work together. And we've long since started talking about that in terms of um, overall consumer experiences or experience design, of course. Uh, and today, when I think about a product, you know, a, a modern product, a technologically driven product, um, applications in particular, I think of them really as services with affordances, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we look at a lot of applications through the flow um, that they uh, are experienced in, and the net effect is not a concrete thing or a tool, but a dynamic, involved service. And that, you know, that in that sense, the world's uh, sort of uh, completely changed from that old view of you know you buy a thing and it does what it does to these products and quote slash services that are integrated and. Um, dynamic. They learn uh, about us and they continually evolve to become something more and more valuable to us. So I, w I was thinking about this topic before the show and the question that really came to my mind is, um, you know, the, the relationship with products and services is changing, but how do we use designed to actually create more meaningful relationships because I think that's one of the biggest challenges uh, at this moment. Yeah, more meaningful relationships. Well, um, we're struggling right now to make sense of this shift. It's pretty easy to design a toaster um, when the meaning of a toaster is pretty well defined. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And it's pretty easy to design the ideal way to serve someone ice cream. Mm. Uh, in an ice cream store, so a, a nice sort of simple example of service, or take like renting a car, that's a great example of a service design. Uh, what does it take to go rent someone's car? Uh, but if you look at technology and what it's done, it has, um, and so what does it take to do a good job? You really have to understand the not only the technical framework uh, and, and therefore what's possible in rethinking that. Of course, you could continue to do it the way it's always been, done, like uh, continue to rent cars the way they've always been rented. But look at like what Zipcar is. Uh, look at what like um, Audi Silver Car service is or um, some of the other services that allow you to actually rent someone's personal mm. automobile, mm. you know, uh, off the street. Those are completely leveraged off of a new technical framework. The fact that a person can um, use their car dynamically and that there's enough data uh, that's real-time and available to the application that allows us to understand, is that car available? Something normally 
kind of built into the service framework has now become a technical framework. So to me, what does it take to understand and design now is the affordances that we would normally think as static are really dynamic components, things we would normally train human beings in a service design to solve for, um, you know, that would be normally back office operations maybe in something like a classical, like Hertz rent a car, mm -hmm. are now technological affordances that um, not only move the human aside, uh, which is kind of a scary proposition in some respects, uh, but, you know, they, they dynamically become part of that service. They also open the door to things you thought you couldn't do, like rent a personal car, right? Rent someone's personally owned car. Um, so the idea of the business itself becomes a uh, design component. We normally, you know, I, I grew up in, in the early 90s. There was a sense of a real dynamism in design around um, emerging businesses that were taking advantage of new kinds of devices. But the whole idea of the whole business itself could be in question has, that's really been a, a crazy phenomenon in the last 10 years. So to me, you know, a design problem today often entails how do you even want to conduct the business? You know, mm -hmm. dot com introduced the idea of conducting a business for free with a customer and earning the uh, business value in other ways. So that's even uh, part of the question: How do you redeem value? Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think? Because a lot of has changed within design the, the recent years. What do you think is the or maybe there are more aspects of design that we are not utilizing enough or should utilize even more when actually building meaningful services and products uh, on the technologies that exist today. So what are the aspects of, of design that we should really cherish? Um, let's look at that at like a spectrum. There's two ends of the spectrum to me that really um, uh, intrigue me or, or I think are sort of really critical. Uh, one end of the spectrum is a still very humanistic passion we have for touch points, for things. Um, so even when we talk about this very somewhat abstract notion of a service, in the end, the measurable parts of it are these touch points, these moments um, where you're engaging an artifact and the qualities of the experience can be endowed um, through that artifact. It can be expressed or sort of punctuated through a great thing, right? A nice moment, a nice experience mm -hmm. is driven by that. And so I think, uh, particularly today, really thoughtful software design still and industrial design um, still is a critical leverage point. No matter how abstract some of these services mm -hmm. become, how data centric they become, um, and Apple, of course, has taught us all over uh, the, the last uh, several years, especially the sort of the Steve Jobs Renaissance years, you might call them, <laughs> helped reinforce the idea that despite some of the abstractions we experience in this new data centric universe of products and services, that touch points, really beautiful things, still matter. Yeah. And uh, it, Beautiful yeah, or right. elegant touch points. Yeah. Those, elegant those kind of words, right? Yeah. Um, and the second and thing, yeah. Ownership, yeah, and, and in that sense, ownership and perception of those objects matter. The, the second thing is, uh, and it's more of an emerging factor, but it's um, uh, deadly serious right this moment, which is um, the growing intelligence of these participating affordances. What I mean by that, you know, untangle that complex statement is we have long thought of um, the objects around us and the processes around us as largely fixed. But we're now getting to the point where the processes itself can not only have, you know, let's say we could design a car rental process that would thoughtfully adjust to um, different factors. But we designed those factors and we designed how it would adjust. We're now getting to the point where intelligent systems can auto-adjust, can mm -hmm. auto-invent um, mm -hmm. the process itself. The very um, it can fine-tune um, the criteria for the adjustment of these things. 
Um, we're, I'll give you a concrete example because all of this gets kind of loosey-goosey as we talk about it. Um, we're working on a financial advisor engine with an AI company, a, a great uh, customer of ours, Cognitive Scale. Now, this financial advisor is at the core a basic service that helps a customer, an investor, work with an advisor, mm -hmm. right? So that service, the advisor is largely the interface uh, for the service. The advisor is giving advice uh, on, on investments is heavily powered behind the scenes by an assistant, an mm -hmm. intelligent assistant to that advisor that is rapid fire giving advice. And so the second, for example, the second uh, the customer asks a question, the, the assistant fires off a handful of very strongly quantified um, ideas for the advisor to decide themselves they're not out of the equation how to react to it. They could ignore it, um, or they could act on that advice. Yeah. And what it ends up doing is, is not only um, deeply empowering the advisor uh, with, you know, what you call information at their fingertips, which is kind of a cliche, but it is in a lot of ways almost beginning to overstep the advisor's own intelligence, mm -hmm. their own capacity to conceptualize and, and deliver support to that customer because this advisor is this assistant is learning from everything the advisor does and it learns at a what you call a much more perfect rate um, it's much much faster it can calculate and look sift through for example the entire um, history of a stock and we've got an example that we uh, played out where a customer asks about um, a particular FBI raid with a customer, you know, something that you would think would be immediate, like, oh, my God, maybe we should sell that stock. Mm. Um, but the system was able to sift through and go, well, that actually happened 10 years ago. Something might be generally forgotten. And this st stock did dip, uh, as it you know, usually would in a situation like that. But then it quickly rose because this investigation was one of many standard investigations that happen for a particular reason. And therefore, the advisor has a really kind of a, a non-intuitive point of intelligence, something they could not have conceived of themselves. So that, that just completely changes the framework of this engagement. So if we step back up, step back away from this, we realize like designing for those kinds of interactions is fundamentally transformed by the fact that there's something in some way smarter than us in the process or more nimble than us and it's not like another person but it's you know, like like a two-year-old that can memorize the entire telephone book and spit it out anytime we need it yeah and uh it learns from us and that like i said it fundamentally changes the equation of what we're designing we're really like designing uh it's uh, how do you how do you best surface this little guy? Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in our normal we're, we're designing the the, the the context for in which maybe things like these intelligent services can perform optimally. Where does maybe we're designing for AI? Yes, we it's, it, you become a, kind of a backseat driver, mm. uh, even though we still think of ourselves um, in the front seat, um, and 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 actually. One of the most exciting design uh, exercises right now is coming up with those interfaces. Mm. And so the, I'll give you this example again. Um, we still have the, the sort of uh, conceptually the dynamic in exchange going on between a human and a human, the, the customer and the advisor. And the assistant, the AI assistant, is a third member of the conversation mm. and rap rapid fire offering up ideas but it's still on the part of the advisor to ignore that. So it's like the much smarter citizen sitting next to the doctor or the financial advisor or the concierge um, still having to communicate through the human being as the sort of final arbiter of value and truth. And there's a, that's an interesting dynamic that we haven't really played out. Huh. Normally, we take the superior actor and put that in the front, right? We're, we're not ready for that yet, I guess. We're not. <laughs> Mark, let, let's move on because we have, some, we have 
more things to talk about. And uh, the, the second topic, I guess it all blends into each other, but it will give you the opportunity to, to, to maybe look at it from a second different perspective. Let's play the second round of Jeopardy. And this question is the greater world of product design. All right. Um, what is happening in the greater world of product design? And I think we've touched on this a little bit, but, uh, and I do, I think it's important that anyone who calls himself a service designer or has a passion around service design um, or those who consider themselves, I'm a product designer, realize that it is irrevocably compressed now to more of an industry that has to look across those, um, what once were more discrete services capabilities. And at the same time, I think there's a kind of a verticalization that happens. Um, there are is an emerging new concept of, let's say, like an industrial designer, a software designer who is intentionally artifact centric, who is intentionally saying, I'm going to need to work with somebody who is experience focused. I'm just going to work on the things. Mm -hmm. But let's set that person aside. That, that, um, Every industry verticalizes. Um, yeah, th th those are like the craftsmen who know how to work. Those are the craftsmen, who, right? And it's great. It's yeah, great. We need that them. used to yeah. be the sum total of what it meant to be an industrial designer, and now we have um, this, that that what what remains of the generalist designer, uh, experienced designer, or product designer, has to think in terms of the overall experience, which is. Um, transcends the artifacts and services to become something more holistic. Mm. So that is, you know, in a nutshell, what is happening in the greater world of product design. And so uh, it means our vocabulary has uh, greatly expanded. It means the interplay of artifacts and the processes the sort of, of engagement, the services um, that are the sort of cumulative effect of, of a customer engagement um, are part of the problem. Right, those are that is the sort of envelope that we solve for. You can't um, do the one or the other, either, right? There. Yeah, you... yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I think it doesn't even stop there, and I think this is the part where we haven't yet even um, begun to become sufficiently talented, and that is in the depth of understanding of data and the capabilities of intelligent systems within this scenario. As a designer, I think we still feel our contribution as a dominant contribution to how to define the behavior of things and how to, find, how to define the process, the flow mm. of a transaction, of a service, right? It is a human-defined thing, and it, it, in almost all of the experiences when I encounter designers, they still think of it as once it's designed, it is, it is a done thing. But data and intelligence, artificial intelligence or computing intelligence of any form, even the simpler forms, um, invoke a certain dynamism to those designs that uh, we have to, you know, ironically design for. You, mm -hmm. you have to create a, a set of abstractions to how something might come out. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you know, I go back to my financial advisor, um, the outcome of that in encounter really depends on what, not just how um, our interface that we design that goes between the advisor and the uh, customer works, but how the artificial intelligence system contributes. And it contributes in lots of different ways. It contributes in ideas, it contributes in observation and ongoing learnings. Like this worked last time, he doesn't like to calculate um, his transactions this way, he likes to calculate them that way. He prefers to trade in this manner. Um, his threshold of success is this, you know, referring to the customer. It, it also actually provides the transaction assistance, you know, so it presents mechanically all the necessary uh, forms and um, uh, tables uh, for engaging those problems. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's not just the integration problem, but the learning to design with dynamism inherent in the process. Um, these external influences. That's, that's, uh, that's really, I guess that's really bad. powerful. And I, I understand what you mean that designers are used to actually seeing some form of, uh, of maybe not even tangible, but their result of the work being an, an artifact or a process. But if these aren't the things 
uh, not only the things we should be designing. What, what's what's next or what's left? You know, <laughs> if we well, can design these fixed things, the, it, dynamic okay. systems. How, how okay. do we call it? It's not that scary. It's <laughs> not that scary because, uh, for example, cool. yeah. I've been making yeah. journey maps for 20 years. Some form of what we now call an experience journey map, mm. right? Which is the sort of ideal flow a customer should go through if everything works out. And we would occasionally create these sort of branches. And the branches would be, well, here's this option for the oh, journey, oh. or here's what happens if they refuse to do this. But those were more exceptions. Programmers have long understood how to create a highly articulate, logical diagrams for how an application might flow, which has hundreds of forks. They're far more directional forkings than flow. They've also long understood how to define statefulness, um, how to define branching um, in a very artful way. And that, that is software, you know, the nature of creating software at the root. And so as we design experiences, I think we're going to migrate to more looking like a programmer. So we, we Not need a programmer to... in code, but a programmer in experience elements, experience touch points, mm -hmm. in that it'll have far more forks, far more logical mm -hmm. um, potential states, mm -hmm. and driven by the sort of logic. Yeah. Sorry. So, I... No, no, no. It's, it's just uh, it fascinates me. I, I have a bachelor degree in software engineering, so I sort of try to understand. You get that, right? I, I get it. And uh, it's like uh, we need to make smaller chunks and make... Uh, the, the, the ends and the beginnings of these chunks super flexible and, and highly, uh, I don't know, communicative and in the world of, of software that's APIs, but in uh, how but do you... Humans can define boundaries within software. We've long done it. Take like yeah. a super nerdy example, like I want to mm -hmm. render a button. You know, the earliest buttons I would render, let's say, let's say 1993, I'm doing an interface for compact computer, if you remember them. But we would render buttons that would be rendered in Photoshop, early version of Photoshop, and the label itself, the, what the button said, would be rendered in the art of that button. And so everything aspect of the button would be this fixed piece of art. So the designer, you might say, had complete control over that experience element. Mm. Now move up to today, the modern, quote, button, a simple, simple object, is a definition of something where statefulness, the width of the button, even the potential size and the label, all of that is abstracted outwards into the software. So it's it's all dependent on context, when mm. it and where it needs to render. The style of the button might be dependent on uh, you know, what the state of the software is at the time. All these things are dynamically assignable now in that simple object. So we think about our flow, designing flow today. We're still kind of moving past that point where we get to design that flow as a very concrete thing to needing to learn how to design flow. We're still with human boundaries. Like when I design that, the new button, I can still say it's always going to be blue at the core and maybe it turns orange in this state. So I have still human controls around it. I can still artfully choose things like fonts and border. Mm -hmm. Even in that abstraction that it now exists in, it's not lost to a humanistic cause. And so we think about flow in the same way. There's a lot more factors that will weigh into it, but we as designers still are responsible to build boundaries um, around ideas of acceptable interactions or desirable interactions. Mm -hmm. There's just many more possible variables injected into that process. And those variables aren't necessarily human-driven variables. They're externalities, uh, largely software externalities that we now weigh in our thinking. So we have to, we're sharing the design responsibility, you might say, with system. <laughs> uh, Mark, yes. let's, move, yeah. let, let, let's move on uh, to the third and final topic. Uh, and um, it's, it's a really good topic because it's just a topic of moving forward. And well, okay. what's your question that goes along with this one? All right, so with all of this, um, you might say, blowing up around us, uh, the way I think about the, the change going on right now, um, how do we move forward? And, and uh, to me, it is um, the embrace of this dynamism, 
the acceptance that that dynamism isn't just in a few corners of, you know, I pointed out an AI uh, cognitive assistant for a financial advisor, but understanding that's affecting how one orders a hamburger at McDonald's uh, soon enough. In fact, I was in, uh, I think it was in Munich, uh, that I went to a McDonald's where I was using software that was driving uh, it, you know, it was a kiosk that I, ha I needed to make my order in. By the way, it was a giant pain in the ass. So, the, you know, I'd say it was an initially a service design fail. But I can't imagine the food ordering process being able to net out what people are ordering that day, what people order in that location, and what I typically order into a much greater experience. So it's not merely a passive recipient behind the counter saying, what can I get you? And me having to browse the totality of the menu into a future where it's a much more dynamic experience. So to me, moving forward is people in, in our industry believing and understanding how encompassing this change is. There is not a safe place for you as a practitioner and uh, to embrace these new skills. Um, uh, is absolutely necessary. Well, talking about skills, Mark, what advice would you give people that want that need to what use new skills? This? Oh my <laughs> God. What, what new skills? What, what study would you do today? What, what First of all, what new skills? The answer is all of them. I mean, mm -hmm. well, the capacity of the human mind to learn things is is limitless. You mm -hmm. just have to choose to. Um, now, with that said, um, the focal areas I would say is really start to understand some, uh, at least the, um, the surface level uh, art of data and data analytics and um, design with data. And then learn to understand what's actually happening with um, AI. What is AI really about? What are the modalities of AI? For example, there are systems that respond to queries and they are able to provide a better answer simply because they bring more factors to the table. Okay? They can do things like quantify different answers against a whole set of variables that you don't normally apply to a question. Things about me, things about the moment, things about the state of um, that it, the information available. Um, and so that, in a lot of ways, you could just think that's super search. Uh, there's also learning systems, systems that are observing and in the background deciding when to provide insights as delivered. Insight is an, a concept, an object. If you learn about what an insight is, it's an almost semi-formal object. It's not quite formalized yet, but it is becoming so in the industry. The delivery of an insight is a mechanism, and it's a mechanism you can employ in uh, if you're trying to design a medical system, a financial advice system, or food ordering at you know a place like McDonald's. Uh, so these concepts, these objects, and the technical systems below them. I'm not asking you to become a designer, a programmer, but as a designer, understanding these technical notions become becomes deeply empowering. So it's, 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 like, it's like knowing the characteristics of data and AI as the new design material. Yeah. It's, look, 10 years ago, I used to nag um, my uh, studio full of designers to understand um, the GDIs of the major operating systems, like to understand what a standard approach for a dialog box was for Mac OS versus Windows. The fact that OK and Cancel are on opposite sides on those two platforms. And things have normalized, by the way. Uh, and now we have iOS, which has a whole other set of standards, and Android, which has another set of standards. And, and designers now get that they have to understand that space, just like industrial designers have to understand materials, uh, draft angle, uh, different manufacturing processes, things like that that um, affect their choices. To me, you're going to become, if you're going to be a competent service designer, you have to understand these technical aspects and they will in five years feel a lot more ordinary. So this is just a beachhead calling, like, okay, you better these things. That, that's why we're doing this show. We, we want a glimpse into the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Mark, Mark, so we're sort of wrapping up, and uh, I know you didn't prepare for this question, but I'm sure you have one. And this is your opportunity to ask the people who are listening or viewing this episode a question. What would you like to ask us? Yeah, uh, I'd like to understand what most service designers are spending their time doing. And given that, you know, it's really a two-parter, um, how many of you feel truly integrated with the greater sphere of product design versus um, successfully operating as independent service designers? Uh, I'd love to understand that. Um, you know, for me, my perspective of service design comes from the world of product design. So I'm, you know, hammers see nails. Uh, and, and I think my perspective is well informed, but still, I'd, I'd love to understand how other people see the world awesome post your comments in the comments uh yeah, mark I'll read it's, it, it's uh it's time to sort of wrap this episode up so thank you for your time thanks yeah it's fun so what is your takeaway based on what we've just discussed in this episode let us know share your thoughts and ideas in the comments and remember, more people like you are watching these episodes and your comment might just be the thing they need for the next meaningful breakthrough. If you want to learn more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we discuss here on the show. I'll see you in two weeks time with a fresh new episode. Thanks for watching and see you then.